Hello, welcome to Up Level Academy's Let's Master Creative Writing. Now, creative writing is an area of English where students either love it or hate it. It's the marmite of English. And some of the reasons why students love it is because it allows them to have um, the freedom to use their imagination and to be creative. And for those who hate it, um, they tend to be students who say that they're not creative um, and they find it difficult to come up with ideas. Now, in this video um, today, Let's Master Creative Writing, we're going to be helping to demystify creative writing so that you're able to obtain the maximum marks available to you. And I should say that this part of the exam is worth quite a lot for language paper one, where you've got to write a story or a description task. And it doesn't matter whether you are doing at Excel, AQA, OCR, Educast, WJC, IGCC, it's still worth a lot of marks. So it's really vital. So let me share my screen with you all. And we're going to start by looking at um, what students are currently taught, because it's always good to start off where we are at and access assess where we are. The reason being is by only knowing where we are, can we start to think about, okay, well, what's working, what's not working, so that we're able to move forward accordingly. So some techniques students are taught are mnemonics, such as DeForest. Now, DeForest is used commonly for language paper two with the writing section, um, where they have to write, where students have to write. You're still using creativity to write an article, or a leaflet, or a letter, or a um, diary entry. So it tends to be the non-fiction side. And DeForest stands for direct address, alliteration, facts, opinion, rhetorical question, emotive language, statistics, testimonials, or um, triplets, depending on what you've been taught. And you can see that there's some crossover with some of the techniques that you use for description and for story writing. And it's a great tool, okay? So I'm not knocking mnemonics, they are great. They can help students to revise and to recap some of the techniques. But what is missing is the why. Why do students need to use them? So too often what we see is students using direct address, alliteration, rhetorical questions. But to be honest with you, it's ineffective. And so they don't score high marks. Now, why do they need to use it? Well, why do you need to use these techniques? It's all well and good remembering them, the what, but we need to understand why. Well, students need to use them because it helps to convey your idea in an impactful manner, okay? That is why we're using them. But too often, because students do not know this, they end up using techniques for the sake of it and expect to achieve high marks and they don't. And it's frustrating because they feel that they're doing everything right, they're remembering them, but they're not using them effectively. And the same is true for how to even structure a story. I've seen students who say about um, the story mountain that they've been taught, they tell us about the story mountain they've been taught and it's very rudimentary, it's beginning, a buildup of action, a dilemma, resolution and ending. So in the beginning, they're taught to introduce the characters or establish a setting. There's a buildup, so rising tension. There might be clues as to what will happen next. Character motives might be revealed. And there's a dilemma. This is where there's a problem that presents itself. A mystery arises or there's a disagreement between characters. So something happens, something goes wrong. And then there's a resolution. Now, a resolution um, could be that there's... Um, all the problems that have arisen are resolved. You might answer whether the characters get what they want. And a resolution doesn't mean that everything is tied immediately. It could be that they don't as well. And then there's the ending. Does it end um, entirely with everything explained? Does it leave on a cliffhanger? Now, again, can you see the problem with this? This focuses on the what and not the why or the how. So students, again, remember this. And it becomes, the writing becomes very formulaic. And students then struggle to become creative, to use their imagination. Or they might be taught a five part structure. So, setting the scene, inciting action, framing narrative, opening with dialogue, and then ending. Now, the problem with this 
is that again, it's very formulaic. And some of the worst piece of advice that I've heard um, students say is that they've been told that they should memorize set passages or memorize some of the work where they've achieved a high mark. And I've heard, you know, students have come and said, this is what my teachers have said, this is what other tutors have said. And they're being told basically just to memorize a piece of writing and then try and wedge that into their exam. Now, sadly, what ends up happening is, as I said, students try to force what they've memorized um, in the exam and it results in well-able students doing badly. And this is tragic because students feel that they can be coached effectively to pass the exam without truly understanding what is being required of them, what's being asked of them. And if you don't believe me, take a look at these examiners' reports. Now, these are from a collection of examples. The first one is AQA. Um, and I really want to zoom in here so that you can see this. So it says, however, a, a new and rather alarming trend this series is a virtual rewriting of the source material. Some students borrowed extensively, either incorporating phrases, sentences, or whole paragraphs into the work, or replicating Moss's entire story word for word, just changing the name Alice to something else. So what that means is where students have been told that they can magpie ideas from the reading section, but rather than being taught how to do it and why to do it, they've been told what to do. And so what's happened is the students have basically copied it and can't you can't score high marks for that so they've ended up with a very low grade or it says that to further areas where students were less successful will formulate responses with a contrived use of sensors for example here and so what that's saying is that students an examiner can tell whether a student is writing um, authentically spontaneously and answering the question or whether they're just memorizing what they have been taught memorizing a passage and just trying to jemmy that in. Um, and that's from an AQA exam board um, examiner's report. And then here, this is from OCR, crucial to our approach at all levels is the dual focus on the narrative and choice. We believe in offering students a choice in which narrative they are asked to create to enable better, more authentic responses. And that's the key word, authentic. Authentic means original. They want to hear your child's voice. They want to know that your child is able to write deliberately and impactfully, okay? Drawing on their experiences, yes. Drawing on what they've learned and all the practice that they've had, sure. But they don't want them just to try and regurgitate what they have learned. English is a subject where it's very much um, implementing what you know. It's not just regurgitating, which is why there are a lot of unseen passages in language and in literature to try and create that because they want to see your child has understood these skills. And thus, this is because these skills are fundamental, not only for the GCC exam, but beyond that. Think about when your child needs to write a personal statement. Yes, there is a set structure for that, but it has to be very unique. Remember, there's going to be thousands of students um, writing, um, writing a personal statement for universities for the same course, drawing on their limited experiences as a young person. And so what's gonna help them to stand out is their ability to use language creatively, to use structure effectively to convey their ideas. So this is why it's a really fundamental skill to master. And the last one here is from Edexcel. Um, Edexcel. The specification entitles this section imaginative writing, imaginative writing, and it's worth reminding yourself about the range of what that entails. There's no set text type for this section. Candidates are expected to produce clear and coherent text and write for impact. Now, the reason why that's important, again, is because um, where students are taught formulaic responses, uh, they are often um, are taught a specific genre or writing style and are led to believe that that's going to get them the most marks, which is not the case. It's about answering the question. And so even more point in this is that even if students get lucky um, and what comes up happens to fit what they have memorized, they have not mastered these skills, like I've said. So then what happens is maybe um, by strike, you know, your child strikes um, gold as such and what they've memorized does come up in the exam there's something that is really applicable and your child scores a really high grade which is fantastic in the short term because what ends up happening then is that they are given this false sense of confidence that they have understood 
how to write for purpose, for impact. And then later on, when it comes to personal statements, when it comes to cover letters, when it comes to being able to convey the ideas, to write a pitch, to do a presentation and use these techniques that aren't able to do it, which is basically what you're doing is just delaying the frustration for your child. And so if we have a look at what examiners do want, we can see that it is not what will help you, your child achieve a grade nine. So just memorizing mnemonics, memorizing set passages, we can see that that's not going to help your child to achieve a grade nine in their English. What examiners do want to see is that your child can use the techniques, techniques that they have used to analyze in the reading section in their own writing effectively and appropriately. Write for impact by deliberately evoking a thought or feeling in their reader. Write in a particular style suitable for the question and use vocabulary to express the ideas clearly for the readers. So how can we help your child achieve this? Well, these are so simple, um, these three simple questions by following what up level can we call our three secret questions. So these are the three secret questions that we teach all of our students. Now, these are so simple, yet they're overlooked. And because they're so simple, um, students often are shocked because it doesn't fit into all the work that they've been taught to do, you know, memorizing these set structures, just memorizing all the what's. And so when we make it this concise and efficient, students are often very um, reluctant. But when they start to put it into practice, the penny drops, they understand, they understand the why. Now, although these are three secret simple questions to help your child achieve a grade nine in their creative writing, um, I should say that they are not shortcuts. Now, what I'm about to reveal is that they do take practice. So while they're simple, they take practice to implement and they take practice to master, okay? So this is not for you if you're just looking for a shortcut. If you're looking for something that's gonna be effective and that is going to save you time and allow you to be efficient and effective with your revision so that you can understand the why, so that you're able to confidently approach any exam question that comes up for the creative writing section, then this is for you. So the three questions you need to ask yourself before any creative writing task so that you can be sure you're answering the question in a way that the examiner will give you full marks are as follows. One, what is my genre? Remember the genre is a style, okay? So imagine if you were going into a bookstore, it's where you will find the different categories, right? So if you were looking at fiction, you would look at like maybe adventure, romance, okay? There's a style. And that's gonna help you determine the style your writing takes. Then you need to think about, well, what is my theme? What is the idea I'm exploring? Now, this is really crucial because it will help you to determine what techniques to choose. So for example, what motifs to choose, what imagery to use. So it's really powerful. And then the third question is, what is the emotional journey I want to take my reader on? This is how you want your reader to feel at each point of the story. Can you see how this is different from the story um, mountain? The story mountain, as I said before, focuses on the what. This is focusing on the how. So think about it if you are reading a book or watching a film. If you had the same emotion all the way through, you're going to feel bored, you're going to switch off, you're going to shut the book. If um, the storytelling is poor, then you might not feel anything. You might just feel confused or bored, right? So it's really important that you have a strong emotion that you want to evoke in your reader. And then by knowing that, it helps you to determine what you're gonna focus on, the choice of words that you're gonna use, and even your characterizations to bring that to life, okay? So here are some example openings from some of Up Level Academy's GCC Year 11 students. So um, this student um, used the three questions to create impactful stories in alignment with the examiners, what the examiners were looking for. So here, um, what we're going to say is that these students actually, so I had initially chosen one student, but decided 
to choose um, a few instead. So we're going to look at these example openings from Up Level Academy's GCC Year 11 students. And these students use the three questions to create impactful stories in alignment with what the examiners were looking for. OK, so and these are taken from Educas. They're taken from the WJC and AQA. So you can see there's a collection. So it doesn't matter what exam board you are studying. So example one, forcefully yet carefully, they strap his knobbly ankles to the squat oak legs of the electric chair. Although he's very much alive, with his stream of warm blood cascading around his veins, arteries and capillaries, like a river on a journey to the seas and oceans, it seems futile at this very moment. He is just as much dead as he is alive. Incapacitated, he has no choice but to accept his fate. However, his body is still fighting. Perspiration drops, drips down the side of his head as if it is a timer to his own death. To try and escape from the tumultuous situation, his brain transport, transports back to happier times. Daddy, a gentle young girl's voice cries. So you can see this is an effective opening and you might want to pause it here and think about well, what emotions are evoked in you? How does it make you feel? Does it make you feel tense? Does it make you feel um, curious as to what's happened, okay? Um, and you can see that all of the imagery is related to this idea of life and death and life ending, okay? So you can see that by knowing the genre, the theme and the emotional journey that they want to take their reader on, it helps them to bring their ideas to life, through their sentence structure, their imagery, but also the structure of their ideas. We start off with the present, what's happening, and then we have a flashback in the form of this person's memory. Example two is quite different. Um, example two is quite different because here we start off with dialogue. I can't stop the bleeding, the bold paramedic yelled while applying pressure on the hapless man's leg. Blood pooled onto the floor, soaking through the hastily wrapped, now scarlet cast. The man groaned, his face reddened and twisted in agony. So again, very short, very sharp, very different feel from the first one. So again, pause it here and think about, well, what's the emotional journey that you're going on here? What's the impact on you? What do you think is the genre? What theme do you think they are, they are exploring? And while this, the second one also seems to have you know, death or, or something fatal, just like in the first one, it's a very different take, isn't it? Um, there's a, a lot more urgency in the second one than perhaps in the first one. In the first one, there's a tinge of regret and sorrow. In the second one, it doesn't have that. And now let's look at example three. There's an estate at the bottom of our road, so vandalized and full of graffiti that you don't know whether to stop and stare like you're in a pop-up art gallery. A big old estate. It must have once been built for promise. A way for the council to home as many people as possible. And that should say house. As many people as possible. If you stand and stare long enough, you can see the hopeful details. Potted plants outlining the building, a small park full of brightly colored equipment, and the building itself painted in a vibrant light blue that brought peace and tranquility. But now the paint is dull and peeling off like skin being shed from a snake. The park equipment is now a rotten swing and splintered boards. The plants potted are now a smelly ashtray full of cigarette butts. The windows of the flats are predominantly shattered by kids kicking footballs and clumsily missing the goal. On the ground floor, however, there is a pallid glow that emanates from the living room window, followed by the silhouette of a young boy, Ben. So here, can you see how it's very different? The tone of the style, the narrative voice. We have juxtaposition of what the estate um, is like and what um, it was and what it was like. So we've got here in the present, we've got it being vandalized. We've got what's happened. But not in detail, it's just a statement of fact. Then you have almost, um, you know, um, a conjuring up of what it looked like, the promise. And then at the end, we have what it's like now in more detail, right? So you can see there's a clear purpose with the structure, the language, the imagery, the sensory details, okay? And that's why these three questions are so important because by knowing it, it really helps you not only to know what you're doing, but more importantly, how to do it and why. And you can see from what the examiners are looking for, to achieve the highest possible marks, you must write authentically and impactfully. 
And that is what examiners are looking for. And that is why at Uplove Academy, we don't advocate just memorizing um, techniques for the sake of it. Of course, you need to memorize them, to know them, to understand them. But what's more important is understanding why they use and how to use them effectively. And equally, please don't just memorize passages from work that you've done and think, I'm just gonna regurgitate that because it relies on a lot of luck um, of that coming up in the exam, okay? And as you can see, examiners can tell whether your response seems formulaic, whether everyone's been taught the same thing. So it's really important that when you're revising creative writing that you follow those three simple secret questions, one, what is the genre? Two, what is the theme? And three, what is the emotional journey I want to take my reader on? If you want help in implementing this, get in touch with Kelly McCord at Up Level Academy. We'll be glad to see how we can help you to implement it. Because as I said, it's very simple, which will be um, effective in allowing you to study and revise efficiently and to hone in on what the examiners want. So it will save you time in the long term but it is going to require you to put in hard work and practice, like anything worthwhile, right? It's not a shortcut, which is what the others, the other techniques, like the story mountain mnemonics um, give you. Um, but as I said, they may seem like they're working, but in the long term, they won't. And you'll see that reflected in your grades. I hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure that you comment, like, and subscribe. See you soon.